When we pulled up, we saw smoke coming up, so we came up. Fire coming from the front of the building, and uh, also the north. The fire already had both windows blowing out on the AD side. So that they get the water, so that they can be able to put it on the fire. Basically. Everybody's safe and not having anybody get involved on scene that shouldn't be. Life safety is our number one goal. Once life safety is taken care of, property is number two. Nozzle in the window to kind of knock it down before we made entry. And once hit it, advanced in, hit it again, advanced in. We whip the primary search immediately, and then we'll do our secondary search, which is a little more intense. For extension of fire in the uh, hottest part of the room, but we also look around lights off it. First responders are vital to our understanding of the fire and what's going on long before the fire investigator is, is called. And that's why it's always been my position that they're very important to the prosecution of both criminal and civil cases because they are our ears and eyes at that early stage of the fire when no one else is there. And without them, sometimes prosecutions just can't go forward because we can't establish what was going on very early in the case. Fire companies had to do extensive overhaul. TVs were thrown out into the yard. I had the ability to talk to the companies while they're still on the scene. I talked to these companies and they told me, you know what was funny? I, I did notice something funny about it. I threw three TVs out the window. None of them were even plugged in. I was like, that was interesting. His regular TVs were all at an offsite location and he had gone to a thrift store and purchased older TVs and put them in their place. I look in the closet door to see if there's any clothing. All the clothing was all from thrift stores, still had the tags on it, that he was just assuming was gonna be ash and he could claim his clothing. All, everything was replaced. But this was, that was due to the diligence of the companies noting it and saying, hey, did you notice anything funny when you were doing it? And the, those companies on the scene were very cognizant that they weren't tugging to get that TV off. It wasn't even plugged in. Because lots of times you gotta unscrew the cable or cut it. I look for the color of the smoke. Is it a heavy push or is it a light push? I'm looking at the velocity of the smoke as well. If you smell like there's a different smell or a taste to an accelerant, when you come up on the fire, you can kind of smell. Also, looking at any doors or any windows that might have already been opened prior to arriving. If we know that this is a structure in the time of day that should have been locked up and buttoned up tight, then that would tell us, you know, the investigator would want to know that information. I always tell my crews before they force entry into any door, is to always make sure, try before you pry, that's our saying here. And if it's open already, they have to make a mental note of it that the door was not locked and they did not have to force it. Were the utilities shut off prior, prior to your arrival? Were they locked out by the utility companies? Were they removed? Were the uh, overhead wires cut? Who tripped the breakers? Did somebody pull the main? Did somebody hit all the individual breakers? Who's that guy? The guy at the hydrant, the guy on the engine, have some of the best seats in the house. You're basically seeing the different, the changes in the color of smoke, for example, which indicate whether, you know, they're getting control of this fire or they're losing the structure altogether. You see either the firefighters ventilating the structure or the structure is ventilating itself. Windows are blasting out or, um, you know, just the smoke, the way the smoke is pushing out or if the smoke starts to subside, the color starts to lighten, things of that nature. Those observations are, are paramount in investigations. And we have to come and seek you out. That, that's our end of it, you know? But if it has something to do with the fire, you've, you've got some type of uh, responsibility to at least go to your boss and say, hey, you know, I was around back, and there's a guy running out of the, running out of the other apartment, you know? There's, there's, a, there's a can hanging in the drain. I think maybe as long as we're laddered up there, let's take a look and see what it is. Was it ventilated from the outside? Was it ventilated on the inside? Who ventilated it? Because I may find glass broken on the inside of the structure, and I'm thinking, did somebody crawl in that window? They popped it, or they broke the window from the outside, or was that just taken out by a firefighter walking around the exterior? I'm gonna be looking at the window. Is there sooting on the window? Was there smoke staining and protected areas possibly on the carpet where that glass was prior to the fire, or if that 
if that came after the fact and there's smoke staining on the glass. Generally, we try and account for every patient on the scene. Do we see someone running from the scene or do we see someone that looks suspicious on the scene that's either burned and isn't coming forward or their hands burned? Were they trying to do something in the fire? Any note of any accelerant on them, if they have gasoline on their hands. So we were a uh, we second truck, so I went to the rear and uh, we had force entry and we went in, um, there was acetone, cans of acetone there. And uh, there was rags all over, and you could see where it was. You could see where the flame went, followed the path of the acetone on the walls, and uh, so that was rather apparent. But that was there was three children that were killed in that, so that was pretty horrible. Now the position of a number of things can all come into play, and every little step, every action that was taken in suppression efforts, in rescue efforts, uh, in to what possibly happened prior to their arrival is all evidentiary data that is gonna be necessary for this death investigation. Um, what were their conditions when they came in? Was the house in disarray? If it's a possible um, crime concealment, uh, what did they note? I mean, was this, was this house, was ev did everything look finer? Was the place ransacked prior? Did it look like there was possibly a struggle or a fight or something that ensued prior to this fire incident? People talk so freely to firefighters. The fire service is still the most benevolent service in the world. How can this guy hurt us? He's a fireman. He's here to help. People will certainly make statements uh, when firefighters are tying into a hydrant. Uh, they're kind of busy, but people will say things to them. I always ask the engineers, hey, do me a favor. Just kind of just kind of peruse the crowd, uh, crowds that are gathering, somebody kind of maybe laying off to the side that's uh, just kind of doesn't really fit into the, uh, into the mix, uh, maybe not from the neighborhood, or they're just kind of maybe a little more curious than, than usual, taking pictures. We get a string of fires. Sometimes when you stand out there, you kind of notice the crowd. If you see the same people more as usual, possibly they might be involved in it. If you are on a, on a line, to be able to articulate what you saw and how early you saw it. And we realize with the gear that you're wearing, you, you can't roll up your, your sleeve to look at your watch to tell us what time you saw this. But how the fire behaved, what level it was at, because witnesses come and tell us, you know, the flames were eight feet high. But we go to you and you say, geez, somebody outside said they were looking through a window, the flames were eight feet high. And you, in turn, tell us, yeah, that's because the fire was on the table. It's four feet off the floor to begin with. Was this fire smoldering? Did you add the third element that the fire was starting to lose? When you come in, do you feel that you added the O2 that this fire needed to get itself uh, some zeal again and, and, and rise up? Did, what, how did it act? What did it do? We can use that information and we can work backwards, if, we, if you will. And the tools that, that we might use to do that would be test simulations uh, or reconstructions where we're looking at a, a portion of the building. Uh, we have a particular scenario in mind, but what you're really doing is giving us a data point to, to, to work towards. Uh, and with that data point, it can help us better understand what happened in the fire. I think it's actually made me a better firefighter. I'm still on the companies and I am more observant and now it's changed the whole way I look at a fire now when I pull up on the scene. We did not hear any smoke detectors. We did not hear any burglar alarms going off. And in the front window, you can see a lot of flames. From the initial hit, um, it darkened it down pretty fast. Pretty much no other smells other than plastic burning and uh, like foam burning from the contents. There was some additional smoke coming out of the attic. They did have to force the front door. What we did is just moved a couple sofas around, moved them a little bit check behind her, make sure there wasn't any hot spots. The back door was standing open, which normally, uh, the round, especially around this time, uh, it, that wouldn't be happening. They used a, a stream that was able to, to hit the ceiling and, and fall on to the area of origin of the fire, which is back here uh, on this couch. Even a heater that was involved in the fire is right here, very close to the doorway not outside the house, not on the front lawn. It posed no danger to them. They did unplug it and remove it. However, they left it in the scene. The window broke uh, 
thermally from the heat of this particular fire. The fire service's nightmare, polyurethane foam, uh, a, a very uh, a violent fuel uh, when, it, when it's burning and also extremely toxic. They, however, policed this chair, got it good and wet, knocked it down, ensured themselves that they had it under control. These patterns all the way around this room are very, very important to us as investigators to be able to find the origin and cause of this particular fire. Here, they thought they picked up something on a thermal imaging camera, so they took a pole uh, off the engine, uh, one of their tools, a pike pole, and, and broke uh, probably a, a six by six hole and were able to take a look up in there and were satisfied uh, that the fire had not breached and was not a threat in the interstitial space. You can see here, by these guys not having moved this, moved this uh, couch outside or breaking it in half or turning it upside down, there is some valuable evidence left right here. These newspapers were part of the original area of origin, which is right here on this particular couch. The hose streams, the hose wash, uh, nothing overzealous. They knew they had a void there because of the outlet. It was, it was cleared out so that they could see that fire had not advanced through the sheetrock, along the, along the duct, up the outlet space, and uh, traveled to, a, to perhaps another floor. Uh, they left the chairs, everything intact. It would not be uncommon uh, in some areas of the country to come in and find this sheetrock completely removed. Nothing but stud walls. The furniture would all be outside. Uh, and when the floor has been hosed down and drowned in water, the protected areas, the markings from the undersides of these pieces of furniture are then difficult uh, to, to uh, normally aid you in reconstruction. Uh, these, these firefighters who fought this fire did a, did a tremendous job, left glass intact, left furnishings that were in the room intact, even though they had been badly destroyed. Uh, a brief conversation with this crew and the fire investigator was in really good investigative stead to start taking care of and figuring out this fire. Life safety is our main priority. If we need to damage part of the scene to save a life or protect our lives, we unfortunately have to do that. But otherwise, we try to minimize damage at all costs for both the fire investigator standpoint and for the homeowner. We try and use the minimum amount of water that we have to. Water weighs a lot. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds. With new construction being lightweight, I tend to get more and more water on that floor. I can be a safety factor. And with preservation, if I throw all that water in there, I'm never gonna know what's happening. I can wash everything right out the door. So we try and use as much water as we have to, but not get over crazy with it. We use a combination fog nozzle, and uh, we set it to a straighter stream pattern. It's unlike a smooth bore, it doesn't have the penetrating power of a smooth bore. So it does, it does minimize damage to walls. We don't throw all the everything that's inside the building, outside the building. And as you start your overhaul, if you end up into a non-burned section, stop your overhaul. It obvious, the fire has obviously not gotten there if it hasn't burnt the structural members yet. We don't allow uh, hydrocarbon tools used that are not contaminating the environment and um, monitor at that point who's going in, who's coming out. There are more things now than ignitable liquids left at scenes by people who set fires. There are transfers. Uh, whether it's hair, whether it's blood. Now, you can leave that wall up there and we can see the patterns on when we come in. You're not worried about that rekindle because you can see with the thermal imaging camera that that wall's fine. And now that science has embraced the, the fire service and the investigative end of, the, of what we do, it, it's been nothing but a win-win because groups like NIST and other groups from around the country have come in and said, this is what happened here and this is why these firefighters got themselves caught where they got themselves caught. Ventilation, this was wrong or this was right. Thank goodness they did it this way. If we bypass somebody in initial search, we're doing secondary search. If that individual's still alive, we're evacuating that individual right away. If that person is already deceased, um, 
EMS will be called in and the, the victim will be left there. And, and so you don't want to disturb evidence because at that point it's a crime scene because there's a dead individual there. If there's any chance for survival, the companies are going to try to remove that body and they're going to make every effort to resuscitate. But if this is after the fact, we know it's going to be a recovery. I ask that we try to keep everybody away from that room as possible. The least amount of people that we have coming in and out of that scene or that area, the better, um, because we're going to need to know who all was in that room um, and try to cordon that area off so we could get the best possible documentation of the position of the body, of the clothing, if we need to take samples from the area, take samples off the body. Um, documentation of that room is going to be key. Overzealous overhaul is, is poison, is absolute poison to the fire investigator. It's called spoliation of evidence, which in essence means spoiling the evidence so that people who want to look at the evidence later to find out if it was responsible for the fire have an opportunity to conduct testing. For instance, a fire that starts in a dryer or a toaster or some other artifact that's in the building, um, you want to do as much as possible to keep that artifact preserved so that everybody has an opportunity to test the item to see if it really did cause the fire. Uh, while at present there has been no case finding any government agent responsible for spoliation on the scene, it certainly is coming and there's a lot of pressure to hold uh, investigators, firefighters, and other personnel of the government who are on fire scenes responsible for the damage they cause to scenes and the damage they cause to both civil and criminal litigation because of the spoliation. I noticed that we have a collapse zone problem. The first window was ventilated, the ventilated on its own. We had visible fire as well as smoke coming out of the uh, window in sector one. Uh, the door was locked, we did have to force it. And as they forced the door, we also had visible fire coming out of the door. I took out the second window. It instantly began to steam up. It was a drop ceiling, so you're tripping over all the wires and all the supports that had come out. We hit it, advanced in, hit it again, advanced in. After we had water, we came in, and my partner and I started a search on the right-hand side. We did a right-hand search all the way around. What I usually do is uh, I will take their name down, their phone numbers down, their addresses down, and document that in my report. Where anybody would be coming out of the building, uh, we would try to put them in a, a certain area because we would want to talk to them, get them preliminary information from them, uh, if they lived there or what they had seen. Our first uh, level of documentation is our EMS run reports. Basically, those are legal documents kept with the hospital in our EMS system. We document all their injuries, and we generally transport them to the hospital. First arriving engine officer, first arriving truck officer, seeing, getting their description of what they witnessed, um, that is relayed, in fact, person to person, and myself, I, I relay to the investigator. We usually try to do a report at what we saw, definitely saying that the door was already open for us would have been uh, something we would have noted on that, plus what initially we saw when we saw the fire and if how it reacted, uh, what we moved, what we moved back, and what type of overhaul we did to the, to the building would have been something on the report for the investigator. Did I force that door? Did I throw out the contents of the second bedroom? Did I do a primary of the first floor? And just make note because there may be somebody coming up, a fire investigator asking you later on that day, asking you next duty day. The more serious the case, the longer it takes. You know, if you've got a simple fire to a building where nobody's hurt, it might go to trial in six months or a year. If you've got um, deaths or injuries or you've got a capital case, it could be up to five or six years down the road. Now, you wish you took five minutes to just jot down something as small as a window was open or a door was open or we had to cut through this or we encountered um, furniture put in front of the front door. Well, typically the first responder's testimony would be very short and brief. We can bring them in 15, 20 minutes of testimony explaining what observations they made on the scene. They're typically the types of things uh, such as their initial response, their initial entry, and it provides us with a well-rounded view of the fire scene that uh, is very valuable in the prosecution of a case and may be very valuable in a civil suit if they're looking at where a particular object is and this is the firefighter that entered the location and found the object. So if we 
Get in the habit of making these notes and putting it in the narratives, including it in the fire report by the lieutenant, the incident commander, just being responsible for what your company did and the individuals in your company, that helps considerably. If they're in a situation where they're testifying at a criminal trial, they can expect that the defense lawyer is going to ask them a great deal of questions about origin and cause of the fire. And typically, it's my position that they're not, they're not responsible for cause and origin, they're not trained to do cause and origin. Their role in the fire is to put out the fire, and they just happen to make observations that are relevant to the origin and cause of that fire. You can clearly see the burn patterns, heat patterns going up, going out, ventilation patterns with the window. All that is visible by them just leaving this wall intact. Your electric, you have conduit here, your overheads, they're all still somewhat intact. A number of times, those are gonna be outside. Lots of times, they end up outside. If the fire investigator doesn't get there soon, you may have scrappers that come and grab these lights, grab this, and, and now you got nothing. So now, Everything is still left here. In the event you have to have an electrical engineer come out, the electrical engineer is gonna be able to look at these, they're gonna be able to collect these very easily for any type of lab analysis. You got your drop ceiling, a number of these things are still intact here. You can actually look at the heat patterns on some of the, on some of the beams here. And then you also know any possible, what may be confused as secondary fires, could be things dropping from the ceiling that you're very cognizant of because these guys have not ripped down everything. You know exactly what's up here. You know where the duct work is. Sometimes you have issues with ventilation because you have returns in the area. This duct work right here, it's not all on the ground. So I have a pretty good idea as to which way this duct work was running in the event we have a possibility of it impacting the fire. The whole scene itself, in my opinion, is evidence. And to just be cognizant that when you're in that house, you are in a potential crime scene. You are, there's evidentiary data in the entire room.